All right. Thanks, everyone. I realize we're down to the last hour, but there's some good stuff in here, I promise. Um, so Seb sort of told us all about what Geoscience Australia does in interpreting AM, which is it's a considerable effort. Um, it really is. So having said that, I'm going to take a slightly more negative bent and look at the 10 most common mistakes that we see while people are interpreting AM conductivity data. So Seb and I sort of got together and talked about this a bit. Um, you know, what makes a good interpretation? How should you interpret? And we really quickly came to the conclusion that there is no correct way of interpreting. It's entirely dependent on the quality of the data, what um, other data sets you have, what's the objective you're trying to achieve with your interpretation. So of course there is no, you can't just set up a perfect workflow that uh, will work all the time. Having said that, there are definitely wrong ways um, to interpret. And Seb and I, you know, we've done a lot of, made a lot of these mistakes ourselves. We've seen, we've done a lot of interpreting. We've seen a lot of other people make these errors. Um, we thought it would be a good opportunity to share them with you today. Um, in some ways, AM interpretation can be a little bit of an art. I mean, the AM data is quite vague. Uh, often the questions we're trying to answer, it, it's quite difficult. So. What people tend to do is they tend to insert a bit of a, or form a bit of a story. I mean, a model is in some ways just a story that can allow you to make useful predictions. Um, and what we see a lot of, because I, I do believe geologists are great storytellers, is we see a lot of these sort of, you know, as using the art analogy, these sort of uh, interpretations here, where an interpreter might look at various features in a conductivity model and come up with a grand narrative um, which explains every little um, thing that they see and weave it all together. Now we don't believe that that is a good interpretation um, because we don't think it's justified given uh, the various issues with AEM that we've talked about today. So perhaps using the art analogy again, a better style of interpretation, interpretation is something more like this impressionist uh, painting here. Sorry, I realise I'll do it as Anand does here where you can make out the broad features of what's happening, but none of the detail. Some of this has been covered, but I'll go over it again. AEM initially was a, a bit of a bump finding tool looking for conductivity anomalies, but as we improved our methods, both in the hardware and in the inversion, um, we started pushing it more and more and using it for things like stratigraphic mapping or inferring physical properties. Um, but a lot of this is really underpinned by the assumption that uh, somehow you can map your conductivity onto geology. Um, and that is, for anyone who's done it, that is definitely not always easy. Um, and it can't be done everywhere. And I will expand a bit more on that in this presentation. So a typical workflow um, for stratigraphic mapping, I'm not going to really cover um, an area like uh, mineral exploration that I haven't really been experienced in. Um, but what we might do is compile the AM conductivity models um, integrate it with whatever other data we think is useful. We might bring it into a 3D package, um, look at where we do have good uh, borehole information or outcrop and try to build some sort of correlations so we understand what the AEM is telling us. So is this conductor a clay or a saline aquifer, for example? Um, once we feel we have a good handle on that, we might start interpreting the boundaries of some of these units. and. Once we've done enough of that interpretation, we might use some sort of gridding or 3D modeling technique to create surfaces or geobodies. Um, it really depends on what um, you're trying to achieve. But I'm here to give you a bit of a reality check. Anand has told us already, AM inversion is highly non-unique. Many models can fit the same data. It's quite sensitive to things like geometry of the system or inversion parameters, like using the little knobs and levers that he twiddles and pulls. We get artifacts. We've talked about how AM excels in 2D areas, but where you have 3D non-layer cake geology, you will get artifacts, and you have to take this into account. AM loses resolution with depth. We've said this several times. Um, but it's not, all, it's not necessarily easy to know where, where that loss of resolution is, and it's spatially variable depending on the conductivity of the overburden. And they are overly smooth. AM models. Smoothness is a desirable quality for various reasons, but it's always more smooth than the Earth. So we have to keep this, take, take this into account. Now I'm going to give you a further reality check. The AM bulk conductivity that you might have been delivered or you might have done is definitely wrong. Your interpretation is definitely, definitely wrong. 
that is true. <laughs> and your interpretation might be a liability. If you do a bad interpretation, you might cause somebody to make a bad decision, like drilling a conductor that doesn't exist, or accidentally drilling into an aquifer, which might have some sort of uh, bad outcome. So in some cases, bad interpretations are worse than no interpretations. But I'm not generally a negative person, so don't despair. Um, I'll you know, move this into a more positive light. This is the Menindee test line um, with no AM, just conductivity logs. And yeah, you might be able to do some sort of interpolation, some interpretation on this, but you know, it's all very vague and uh, very uncertain. But you put the AM over the top and you suddenly have quite a good understanding of what's down there. I mean, you can't trust everything. We don't know necessarily what the rocks down there are doing, and I highly doubt it actually looks like this, but you know, we have a good idea of the broad structure. So now for any of you that I haven't scared off, um, who might still want to do some interpretation, we're going to go through the 10 pitfalls uh, that 7 I see and how to avoid them. Um, please, if anyone has any questions at any time, um, feel free to stop, happy to explain, but there will be a practical. Um, so the first mistake I see, and we see this all the time, and it comes down to that Joel just love to tell stories, um, is over interpretation. So when you see every little bump in the section and you start putting a line around it and coming up with some big structural story, um, we call this over interpretation. It's generally not justified by the data. You know, if you have a lot of other data sets that um, tell you that this sort of structure is justified, then that's a different story. But in general, it's not justified. For example, I can see here that this near surface conductor, because of its changing thickness along the line, is causing this deeper conductor to move up and down. You know, you see this with experience, but it, it's very easy to even, even I sometimes get sucked into going, oh, this looks nice, I'll just interpret around this. So this should really be um, avoided at all costs. So believe it or not, this interpretation, while much less pleasing to the eye, is actually a better one than this one because it's less, it doesn't, it's more justified by the data. We see these sort of interpretations a lot when you increase the vertical exaggeration. It creates a lot, um, the impression that there's a lot more structure than what there actually is. Um, so this is one to be very careful with. And does anyone recognize this section? So often the most over-interpreted sections are the ones that are the best to show off to the managers and to show how good AM and is and what a good job you're doing. So just keep that in mind. <laughs> Incorrect attribution. Um, you know, it's very tempting to say, oh, I'm mapping the base of the Cenozoic. That interface, I don't have any bores that I can find. I'm going to call it the base of the Ceno Cenozoic. Um, you know, maybe you can look a little harder. Um, and in this case, and this is a real example, there, were, there was a bore that the interpreter had overlooked. The base of the Cenozoic was down here. This was some other interface. And so they would have put it um, more than 200 meters in the wrong spot. Um, now a caveat here is borehole data can also be wrong. Um, and some, they are often even internally inconsistent. But you, you know, before you go putting lines on a map, you want to be pretty confident that you have done the initial work to integrate the existing data. Mistake number three, and this is something we all do, it's just a matter of degrees, is interpreter bias. I mean, we can only hold so many mental models of what's happening in our heads, and generally what people do is they'll try to confirm their existing model with the data, and they'll only change their mental model if they get a big surprise. Um, so in this example, they've made it quite complex and called this clay-rich Paleo Valley sediment, and this one fresh water, because they might expect that, because they might have heard it in a report or there might have been a different Pali Valley drilled that found freshwater lens at the bottom. Um, but you really have to be aware of this bias and you really have to challenge your own assumptions and consider all the alternatives. Um, once again, simple models are generally best. So here is what I would recommend in the absence of any other data. Now Seb has already covered the depth of investigation. Um, this one, we see this so frequently. G-A-L-E-I um, has a reference model that is resistive, and when it runs out of resolution, it will return. It will, all models go to this eventually. And so it's so natural to put a, a base of the conductor here, but you really have to understand where your depth of investigation is. So as Seb showed, that probably is unjustified. This is 
while less pleasing, a better um, interpretation. Another one that's already been covered is the high, is interpreting errors of high misfits. If, you, if your AM has not fit the data, you shouldn't be interpreting it. Or if you're going to do it, you should do it with extreme caution with everything else in context. Particularly, be very suspicious of these. I know that there's some minerals that explorers amongst you. Um, and there's a temptation to get very excited when we see these. But check the power line monitor and check the misfit for sure. In this case, it's misfits off the charts. You know, we ran a different inversion um, with slightly different settings and it disappeared. So we talked a bit about 3D. Um, AM inversions like the ones we've presented today assume lateral continuity of all layers. As your aircraft moves towards a discontinuous conductor, it will start picking up the signal before it's over it. And will often create these sort of pant leg or Mexican moustache type features. So these ones, a lot of interpreters are quite familiar with this geometry and not trusting it. But you know, there's, there are subtler features, off-end sort of things like maybe this, where you might have a slightly subtler change and something else. People will often call this an antiform, or they'll call it a fault, adding you know, structural complexity to an interpretation that's not justified because it's, what they're actually interpreting is a 3D artifact. So AM is actually not very sensitive to resistors. Um, and we often, well, I've seen it before. It's not that common, but I've seen it before where people will start interpreting things on the very resistive end of the spectrum. So here you might say, oh, look at these little features. They look kind of Paleo Valley-like. I'll just interpret them. But if you see they've, this color bar is quite extreme. They've undertaken what I'm calling in this presentation color bar abuse, where they've stretched the bejesus out of it in order to pull out some sort of contrast, but AM is not sensitive to these features, and these features here are lower probability. Ignoring heterogeneity is, I mean, this is probably half the challenge of AM, is that the conductivity of a volume is a function of the mineralogy of the formation, porosity, salinity of the fluid, weathering sedimentation, um, and these will change, these will vary in space. So just because this guy is a conductor here, doesn't mean he's a conductor here. You know, this, this example I chose because you can sort of see it looks like it continues along here for a while. Um, but imagine if you're trying to interpret something between lines and you're hoping what is a conductor here, you can pick up there. But you don't know what's changed in the meantime. So you just have to be very careful. And of course, as with all of these examples, if you have other data sets that can tell you how to interpret these things, you're much less likely to fall into these traps. We talked a little bit about system geometry. Um, so AM data is very sensitive to the system. Um, and wonky system geometry can create uh, features that aren't geological and they shouldn't be interpreted. We see this a lot in areas with significant topography where to, to keep a safe uh, flight height over the topography, the aircraft will sort of you know, rise and, and then dip again. And what that will do is that will actually swing the frame as well as have quite a in this case, quite a big change in height. And while we can model this, if it's unstable, um, or we can model it, but we often know it, uh, the position of the receiver imprecisely. And this can, this wonky geometry can propagate through to inversion errors. I would not trust this. I would not invert, invert this. There's probably 3D effects there as well. And finally, we've had this mentioned, color bar abuse. This is my pet peeve. Does anyone recognize this fine color stretch jet? The official Geoscience Australia AM color bar. Um, this is what we would call non-perceptual uniform. Um, you can see the example of this gentleman. This is the grayscale of him. And Veritas, which is perceptual uniform, a fine color bar, jet has all these edges in it. You know, edges between the blues and the yellow and the red. And that creates these edges in the image. Of course, it's going to do the same in your AEM. While if you have, and if you do have edges within some of these, these areas where there aren't edges in the color bar, you're going to miss them. Um, I don't know if anyone here has used a histogram equalized stretch. Never do this. I've seen bad things happen when these get used. Um, just to hammer home the point with AEM, uh, I've just grabbed a fiducial out of here and I've pointed the same section using the perceptual uniform viridis and the non-perceptually uniform jet. 
this is a smooth model, as all good models are. And I think, in my opinion, the Veritas does portray this smoothness. While Jet looks just to me like it's got all these edges in it. You know, you can put an edge there, 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 there. And I, I, trust me, when people interpret this sort of stuff, they interpret the edges. You know, I'm not necessarily saying that um, picking this edge is the wrong thing to do, but you want to have an accurate understanding of what your data, what your conductivity is telling you. And color bar abuse is a way to really get um, a poor impression of that. Okay, so after hearing all of this, you might feel like you're in some kind of interpretation hell, but I promise to you that there is, you can, through being quite, um, quite aware of these pitfalls and having a good handle on your data and or on your conductivity, but also all the other, the other data sets and the geology in the area, you can avoid this hell. Um, so I would encourage you all just to be a bit cautious, um, do test your assumptions, understand the uncertainties around AEM, and if you can get a review on your interpretation, this really helps you much less likely to fall into one of these traps if there's two of you.